Good morning, I'm a Quarticon newbie, so uh, w amazing to see uh, so many people here. So, uh, who am I? I, I suppose uh, it's interesting hearing David talk about financial markets, because I spent my life in financial markets. I started at Deutsche Bank in FX, I worked at Merrill Lynch in interest rates, uh, and until very recently, I was in charge of 150 billion pounds of clients' money at, at St. James's Place, where we were invested in 13,000 securities around the world. We had over a billion pounds worth of Microsoft, 500 million pounds worth of BP. Uh, we uh, use State Street, which is a global custodian. So when David talks about settlement breaking the T plus two, that's, uh, that, that, that's, a, that's a game changer. Uh, but look, I'm here to talk to you in three parts, really. As an investor, I spent my life at the forefront of responsible investing and ESG and how we can use money uh, as a force for good. Uh, but I'm also here as, as a dad, and these are my two girls. And, and the reason that's important is the trajectory we're on today when it comes to climate change, but not just climate change, biodiversity loss is not a great one. I don't want to sort of paint uh, a sort of catastrophic picture. You all know the, the facts. Uh, but for me personally, bending the trajectory we're on is absolutely critical. Uh, and this is me on the right. I was born in Holland, and that's important because I was born below sea level. Uh, and we used to ice skate on canals uh, to school. Now, you can't do that anymore because, sadly, uh, the canals don't freeze. Uh, so this was me. I studied glaciology and hydrology. Uh, and this was me doing my dissertation in 1999. Does anyone know which glacier this is? Or what continent? Well, it's Findelengleitscher uh, in Switzerland. So uh, if you look the other way, you can see the Matterhorn. Uh, now, the reason I wanted to share this is, as I say, uh, this is a photo I took of my friend drilling boreholes. We spent six weeks camped out on that glacier, connecting weather data, drilling boreholes, sediment data. Uh, and just a few weeks ago, one of my friends, who's still part of that Alpine Glacier project, sent me this picture. And I suppose the question is, what's changed? And so let me really spell that out. So that peak there is that peak there. That ridge there is that ridge there. That ridge is that ridge. So this whole piece, this was where, it, this here is where I was drilling boreholes. Now we've all seen photos of glaciers retreating, but I suppose for me, I literally spent six weeks on that glacier. So I can't tell you how tangible it is uh, to have that loss of ice. And I suppose a couple of things, uh, when it comes to climate change, glaciers are ground zero. They are the canary in the coal mine. And there's a vicious feedback loop because the more they melt, uh, the more water goes into the oceans and the more sea level rises. Uh, but actually, uh, there's also a, actually counterintuitively, a, a, or there's a cooling effect from glaciers. And so as they retreat, uh, they reflect less sunlight and actually the planet heats up even more. So this is one of the kind of tipping points that we talk about. Uh, and I don't know if any of you in this room works in risk management, but the World Economic Forum creates a global risk survey, and they have been for a number of years. And I suppose these are the top 10. So as they look around the world and they say, what are the top 10 risks we face as a planet? Number one, climate action failure. Number two, extreme weather. The heat wave we had over the summer, the floods in Pakistan, the fires in Australia and California. And three, the one that I knew less about and I've learned more about is just the level of biodiversity loss, the loss of our animals uh, and plants that sustain the planet uh, that, we, that we live on. And so the challenge that we face is that we're running out of what's called our carbon budget. And so I wanted to show a chart uh, from a climate change report, but I thought, you know what, why don't I just convert that and make it look like a smartphone? Because we all, I get serious iPhone battery anxiety when my phone's not charged. But in 1850, we had a battery full of CO2 left. It was all cool. We could crack on. Uh, by 2000 to 2015, we depleted our reserves to 45% before we get to the safe limit. And right now, we are in low battery mode. We literally have eight years left of CO2. So we're producing 40 gigatons of CO2. That's 40 billion tons of CO2 every year that we're pumping into the atmosphere. And we just don't have much room left. 
And look, when we run out of battery, uh-oh, that's not a good scenario. But I think we can change that. Last November, I was lucky to be at COP26 uh, in Glasgow. Uh, in my day job, I'd signed uh, St. James's Place up to be part of the Net Zero Asset Owners Alliance. We just launched the largest global equity fund aligned with a one and a half degree C world, so 14 uh, billion pounds. Uh, but the thing that struck me was that although the conversation was great that we're talking about climate change and the race to zero, we also needed to talk about biodiversity. And so not only are humans causing CO2 and temperatures to rise, the lifestyles we live, hidden to all of us today, but we know it's happening, is destroying nature. So that's problem one. Problem two, climate change is also destroying nature. And then problem three is that nature is the very solution to address climate change. So how can we reverse uh, all of this? And if you're kind of interested in this, I would highly recommend watching a Netflix documentary about the planet, planetary boundaries uh, last year. But we're on a number of tipping points, but actually the biodiversity one, our nature and animals, is, is even worse. And to just put that into context, since I've been alive, 70% of all biodiversity on the planet has been destroyed. Uh, and later on, I'm going to use a case study of how we can reverse this problem. But elephants in 1900 were about 10 million in Africa, and they've collapsed to less than 500,000. Now, I'm going to share with you later just how elephants might be the answer to our problem, which means where I was born, Holland, is going to be underwater in the not-too-distant future. Uh, and if things don't sort themselves out, South London could well be uh, flooded uh, as well. And to really, really bring this home, in August 2019, a glacier died in Iceland, and the Icelanders were like, this is seriously, seriously bad. And so they literally had a funeral for glacier. So we now get these things called glacier funerals. And there's this plaque there and a letter to the future. And it says, OK is the first Icelandic glacier to lose its status as a glacier. In the next 200 years, all our glaciers are expected to follow the same path. This monument is to acknowledge that we know what is happening and what needs to be done. Only you know if we did it. And then at the bottom, August 2019, and 415 parts per million CO2. So that's a measure of the amount of carbon dioxide in the world. By the way, 350 was kind of deemed to be the kind of healthy limit. So we've shot way past uh, that. Now, this is a problem because all of this stuff that I've told you about, and we kind of know, we watch it on TV, maybe some of us watch Frozen Planet on Sunday night, or we've watched some of these documentaries on Netflix, but who is responsible? Whose job is it to fix it? And so if you work in business, everything is about profit and loss and balance sheet. And the truth is, the health of our planet doesn't sit on anyone's balance sheet or profit and loss. But that's the opportunity to change it, because the truth is, that companies affect the world. We know that. You know, let, let's pick a really clear example. If BP extracts oil out of the ground, that causes damage, and then we burn that oil and we create CO2. But at the same time, the world affects companies. When we have forest fires, when we have floods, when we have storms, that impacts the supply chain on which we depend. Even big companies like Microsoft uh, and Amazon and Apple are not immune to nature. And Earth. So we live in this healthy balance, but the two aren't integrated. And the truth is, in my lifetime, and if any of you are from financial markets or economics, uh, we've really existed in a world of huge uh, growth in capitalism. And, 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 and I'm a huge fan of capitalism. I just think it needs to be more sustainable. And I love this quote from the New York Times, which says, yes, the planet got destroyed, but for a beautiful moment in time, we created a lot of value for shareholders. Now, my thesis is we should, and we absolutely need to keep creating value for shareholders. We need economic growth. This is part of the issue. Uh, we can't collapse economic growth, but we need to do it in a way that is sustainable and doesn't impact the planet on which we live. And so before St. James's Place, I used to work in pensions. I used to advise some of the biggest pension funds around the world, the Aviva Staff Pension Scheme, uh, the Nestle Pension Scheme, the Unilever Pension Scheme. And there's this quote from a Dutch pension fund, which I absolutely love, which says this, the returns we need, so that's the financial returns, can only come from a system that works. The benefits we pay, so the pension fund to the members, 
are worth more in a world worth living in. And I think, for me, that is a perfect vision of what sustainable capitalism should be. We all need to see a return on our money. We all need economic growth. But how do we align it to create a world worth living in? And here's the premise. Here's the idea of the talk. What if money can be a force for good? It turns out that the asset managers of the world, the Black Rocks, the State Streets, the Fidelities, the Vanguards, when you add it all up, are investing $100 trillion, $100 trillion. That is an insanely big number across all of the companies uh, in, in the world, and the companies that we know and love, like Apple and Microsoft and, and, and Amazon, as well as all around the world. And so the question is, can these be rewired in a way that creates a sustainable outcome? And, and I think they can. I think money can be rewired. Uh, and, and ultimately, I see money like rivers and glaciers. They just flow. Money is neither good nor bad. It just needs to be directed and pointed in the right direction. And we have a wonderful framework in the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And all I've done here is taken the 17, not one off, which is the Partnership for Goals, and converted it into a quadrant. Think of it as like a QR code. And there were four that represent the planet, climate change, life on land, life underwater, four that represent People, no poverty, zero hunger, uh, quality education, and prosperity uh, and principles and governance. And so how do we have those things? By the way, prosperity is absolutely key. We need economic growth, and we cannot shut down economic growth. And so here's the problem. I think there are three parts to the climate problem. The, the, the narrative that we've been hearing for the last sort of four or five years is the consume less. This is the kind of the narrative of Greta Thunberg. This is the narrative of Greenpeace, of Extinction Rebellion. Uh, now, the consume less does work, right? In my lifetime, we've gone from 4 billion people to 8 billion people. So consuming less definitely solves climate change, but it doesn't help the 8 billion people uh, on, on the planet. So that narrative doesn't work. And I think there's a really interesting psychological thing playing out between outrage, think Greta, and optimism, think David Attenborough. And I think we need both to create change. The second thing that is happening is the transition to renewable energy and the circular economy. Uh, and again, the great thing from COP26 was just how many in the finance world were putting money behind this. Renewable energy now can stand on its own two feet. It doesn't need, uh, it doesn't need uh, support from governments to make it happen. The other thing that's happening is the circular economy. Many of you have Apple devices. The new iPhone is made of 70% reused and recycled material. So if you have an old iPhone, do take it back to the Apple store because you get some money back. But crucially, it gets reused and recycled, reducing the impact. This is great. I just don't think it's happening fast enough. But this is all about rates of change. Let's see what happens in the next eight years. But what we really, really need is to capture more carbon. So in the latest uh, IPCC report, so that's the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, a bit of a mouthful. But just think of the top scientists around the world saying, what do we need to do to address climate change? They have specifically said to hit a two degree C world or a one and a half degree C world, we need significantly more carbon capture or, or the technical term carbon sequestration. So I like to think of the problem as like a bath. Imagine a bath full of CO2 and there are taps. And really all of the conversation to date has been about turning those taps off. Let's move to electric vehicles. Let's move to renewable energy let's consume less. And there hasn't been enough conversation about pulling the plug and capturing more carbon. So one technique that people are talking about is carbon capture. I don't know if any of you have ever seen one in real life. There's one at the Science Museum. Uh, the problem with carbon capture is it's bloody expensive. It's about 100 to $200 a tonne to capture that CO2, so far more expensive than planting trees. So thank you, R3, uh, for, for planting trees with ecology. Personal opinion, I think they're ugly. I mean, you know, the amount of CO2 we need to capture will need a city, kind of, I've called it carbon capture city. By the way, this is a real carbon capture in, 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 in Copenhagen. But we're going to need big, big cities of carbon capture around uh, the world. Uh, so I've got a different perspective. What about if we use nature as the answer? And I suppose I'm going to pose a question to you. Does anyone, apart from Waleed and the team from Rebalance Earth, know what the value of an elephant is? So we do know what the value of an elephant is. And apologies for this photo. I know it's a bit graphic. Uh, 
But every year, 20,000 elephants are poached and killed. And there's a price for that. It's $40,000. So if you're a poacher and you need money, right now, today, elephants are being killed in exchange for $40,000. Well, it turns out, alive, these beautiful creatures are worth $1.75 million. And that's a conservative estimate. That was done in 2019 when the price of carbon was $25 a ton. Right now, that European emissions trading scheme is more like 80 euros a ton. So let's call it $80 a ton. So these elephants could easily be worth three, four million dollars alive. Remember earlier I told you there used to be 10 million of them? And there's now 450,000. And these things sequester, capture a load of CO2. A far more attractive way, I think, of capturing the CO2 that we need to do than Carbon Capture City. And if you want to know more, do pop by the Rebalance Earth uh, stand and talk to Walid and me and, and other members of uh, Rebalance Earth. So look, here's what I think we need. We need a solution that addresses climate change and biodiversity. We need to capture what's called ecosystem services. So all of these animals, whales, elephants, even sort of what might seem boring, but kelp and seagrass provide wonderful ecosystem services. They capture, they suck CO2 out of the air like a vacuum cleaner. They promote biodiversity. Biodiversity is a good thing. We all need biodiversity. And they have other benefits as well. So the elephants, actually, because of the way they feed uh, uh, and uh, and defecate actually increases the fertility of the soil. That is a good thing. Kelp forest and seagrass is amazing at coastal uh, defense. But as we talked about earlier, and you know, what's the mission for Corda uh, is to really, how do we make finance accessible to everyone? And I think the, the interesting opportunity is to make it really easy for every single one of us to invest in nature and not only to offset our carbon impact, but also our biodiversity, and also crucially create income for the communities that look after them. And I think we can create this flywheel of positive change, of evolution that David talked about earlier. And so uh, this is kind of the detail of how it's gonna work, but there's gonna be buyers of these. I'm gonna give an example later on. Uh, there's gonna be the recipients. So imagine countries around the world that might have elephants. By the way, this idea works for everything. It works for beavers. I mean, I'm learning about how this impacts so many different animals. So I like to talk about elephants because who doesn't love uh, an elephant? But literally, gorillas in Rwanda, whales off the coast of, uh, of Chile, uh, this can work. Uh, and we've already heard from David why uh, Corda uh, works, because actually this is all about creating transparency and traceability to really make these kind of carbon offsets, these are kind of voluntary carbon offsets, uh, work with credibility. So picture this. Who flew in to London for this conference? Okay, so I want to imagine you've, I, I don't know if you saw, but actually there were a lot of posters around Heathrow with an elephant and it's got, the elephant in the room is, is climate change. Actually Heathrow is pretty progressive, it, it, it's signed up uh, to net zero, but I want to imagine you arrived and it's got your tickets and it says, welcome to Heathrow. Uh, do you want to offset your flight? Here's the amount of CO2. You can log on your phone, scroll through, pick your favorite animal. I've happened to pick an elephant. I scroll through. I do like Jumbo P.T. Barnum because I think that's pretty funny. Uh, but Rosie the elephant, uh, she's got it for me. So I'm going to buy a token uh, that gives me uh, 11 days worth of carbon capture from Rosie uh, the elephant. But not only do I get a token that offsets my CO2, that gives me a biodiversity credit, but that is creating real money that can go and create real income for the communities that are looking after this. So every day, the Audrey, who is looking after those elephants, she starts to get some money as well. So actually, the big problem with poaching is that most poachers don't want to poach. They are literally on the bottom of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. They haven't been paid for six months. Many of them may have been game reserve people protecting those elephants, but they have no money. So this is really a win-win-win, creating income for these people. So now I want you to imagine not just you arriving at Heathrow Airport, but every year 75 million people fly through Heathrow. It's one of the busiest airports in the world. And what if every single one of them could invest in nature? 
And here's the crazy thing. These are some of the biggest airports around the world. Actually, there's about four and a half billion people uh, or passengers uh, fly every year. But what if over a billion passengers around the world started investing in nature? And I just want to finish on this note. We need one thing, and that is for the planet to stop warming. It's now up to us to make it happen. And listening to David earlier, and he was talking about currencies and evolution, I actually think there's an opportunity for this idea to become so big that 25 years from now, central bank currencies won't be backed by gold. They'll be backed by nature. So thank you very much.